Wow, we're already here. 2023 has been a hell of a ride, and as with most years, was certainly backloaded, because fall really packed a punch. So we're doing my bookend to the preview I released back in October, where I discussed my impressions on the first episodes released, and we're following up with how much I made it through now that the season's over. If a show wasn't in my preview, uh, it's not gonna be here, but don't get too depressed. You can always comment below and tell me how garbage my tastes are for not watching something. Hey, and uh, while you're down there, why not hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on my horrible takes. Let's get into it. There was some stiff competition for the good slots this season. More than a few had my undivided attention and kept me on the edge of my seat waiting for the next episode. But more importantly, several defined or even broke free from their genres, giving us a unique twist on the stories and tropes we've seen a million times that reminded me why I love watching anime. Free run beyond the journey's end. No notes. I'm notant. If you're surprised I'm ranking this series up here, you've clearly been living under a rock. Most fantasy series follow a set story with clear end goals and power creep, but it's been forever since I found one so comfortable just being about the journey. The themes in this one drip with deeper meaning that informs a ton about the characters, world, and story. Free Ren herself embodies a stereotypical aloof elf at first glance, but belies a childish, playful, albeit subdued personality that, despite her long lifespan, is defined by the friends she met along the way. Even if their travels were short by her standards, her past defines her, and she seeks to find more meaning in it. By combining a sense of nostalgia with the excitement of discovery, it manages to be both familiar and fresh with its setting. What sticks with me the most is how well the cast works together, creating strong, believable bonds that stand against the usual character dynamics in anime. In essence, there's just good chemistry, despite how subtle the characters are. And this isn't even touching on the amazing artwork and animation. The story is told with powerful cinematography that carries throughout the whole thing, where most studios would quit after just a few episodes. Free Ren combines the best parts of a theatrical release with long-form storytelling that television anime offers, and I find myself pulled deeper into it each and every week. Shangri-La Frontier was another heavy hitter this season that sort of declined to stick to a genre. Heavy action, romantic undertones, and decently funny, but none of those really define the series. This one captures the true essence of an MMORPG, unlike so many other anime on the market, by utilizing the game mechanics and challenge to actually tell an engaging story about a guy playing a game he enjoys. That mixed with the interesting storyline and elements of the in-story game makes for another experience that pulls viewers in with discovery and intrigue first and foremost. Hell, the fact that the game's mechanics and gameplay actually impact decisions in the story already elevates this one in my book for realism. Not just using the whole VR aspect for an excuse for a fantasy setting. Strong characterization with a likable cast helps sell that, since the main character we spend so much time with is genuinely energetic about what he's doing. The supporting cast aren't one no people just to prop up the protagonist too, as they have their own motives that drives the drama and plot as well. He's discovering all this crap along with the audience, making us share in his excitement. And the fact parts of this take place outside the game makes the world feel that much more fleshed out. It may sound like I'm just praising this because it's better than others in the VR MMO genre, but that's not the case. The elements this does well, it does well as an anime, not just in a niche genre. But what carries this over the top is striking animation and designs, because this series is just beautiful to look at. Definitely worth checking out. The second season of The Saints Magic Power is omnipotent, hit a lot harder than the first for me. I think because it gives off ascendance of a bookworm vibes by just how not focused on typical isekai bullshit it is. And this season was a lot more interested in the world than the political fallout around Say Sainthood. This was never a fast-paced series, but I really enjoyed just how much time it spends with the characters just interacting and building friendships in a romance. As for the animation this time around, uh, I guess it improved somewhat over last. It's never been amazing looking, but the art is nice. And that's about as much as one can ask for a series as subdued as this. There's less of a focus on an overarching story and more just about living in another world. Say has to find her place, adapt to a new culture, and occasionally save the world which makes for a different sort of viewing experience. And probably because it's more of a mature story about love and life, it resonates with me. Especially because it's so antithetical to usual isekai. On the exact opposite end of that, Eminence in the Shadows' second season is your typical isekai experience. 
except the main character's a fucking idiot, and I love it. The draw of this show has always been how purely it distills what actually works in Isekai. People like the badass action, people like the monologuing vague bullshit, and people like the purveying horniness, for some reason. But while it nails all those elements, it's a comedy first and foremost. Now, just to be clear, it's not a parody by any stretch, but an isekai farce about a guy LARPing his fantasy in an actual fantasy world. Now, on the surface, it feels incredibly cliched and honestly sort of dumb, but the childish jokes hide a deeper, theatrical take on comedy and isekai, and I'm here for it. If there's anything that's gotten better as this series has gone on, it's the humor. The rest has pretty much maintained its quality, from the animation, style, and choreography, so I have no complaints. Well, scratch that. I guess I have one. There's just not enough of it. I'm really looking forward to a third season, because this anime is just plain fun. Undead Unluck has a surreal wackiness that captures comedy and action incredibly well, and I think it stands out due to just how normal the world seems, only for it to slowly introduce just how complex and different it actually is from our own. This isn't first episode stuff, we're not even getting some of the fundamental details about the setting until like, 11 episodes in, because it just doesn't really come up. And that's more of a twist handled with good writing, than not actually explaining shit. So yeah, it's more complex than initially presented, and I love that. Getting into the anime itself, it has action, a healthy dose of absurdist humor that plays off the characters' personalities and abilities, while packing some unique action scenes that utilize said absurd abilities our characters have. There's a quirky inventiveness to everything here that doesn't really come across as a gimmick, and it shows a truly creative take on an otherwise overused premise of killing God. And while this is a shonen series, it's not drenched in the tropes to the point that it feels stale. I mean, it has them, but there's a lot more that stands out than feels tired. The only thing that dissuades a bigger recommendation from me is the sheer amount of etchiness that's likely to turn off a broader audience. David Productions knocked this out of the park by leaning into the zaniness the source material packs through bombastic animation. Definitely worth a look, especially if you like shonen battle series. Tear Moon Empire was a sleeper sort of show I couldn't shake this season. Unlike the rest of my list so far, it's a lot less unique, but it makes up for it with a really strong main character, a lighter take on a dark premise, an extremely well-executed comedy with said premise. And there's so many reincarnated villainous anime out there these days, and this one's, well not that, but plays out entirely like one in the best way. It utilizes a lot of the same tropes of correcting major issues leading up to the lead's death without the baggage of being an omnipresent viewer outside of a game. This is just someone struggling to survive when given a second chance. She's not bright, and the comedy of errors that follows her bumbling her way into a brighter future is a source of jokes and intrigue that keeps me coming back. Ultimately, Mia being just as spoiled on the inside as her previous go-around, but dodging all of her death flags through sheer coincidence and misunderstandings is great. But what won me over, aside from Mia, was how comfortable this series is with the story it's telling. It has faith in its plot, and that's kinda rare for a show in this sort of genre. While the animation isn't anything to write home about, the bright colors and style elevate the humor within, creating a nice synergy throughout. An anime's primary job is to sell the source material, and this has certainly accomplished that, because the light novels are going on my reading list for later. There's just so many absolute bangers this season, and Hunter Girlfriends just keeps adding to that list. Harem is essentially a dead genre that's so much of a joke, the only things willing to touch it are porn and isekai, I guess. So why then is a harem show on everyone's mind this season? Well, because it lambasts the concept with extremely varied styles of humor, incredibly energetic animation, and absolutely no seriousness because the only way a harem works is when everyone's strapped with an idiot ball. Despite being a parody, it isn't mean-spirited against what it's satirizing, creating an interconnected romance story that packs a ton of laughs with how over-the-top it can be. Coupled with different styles of humor and wildly different, exaggerated character archetypes, shows a genuine attempt at making the audience enjoy and get invested in this series. Beebody has done some impressive animation work in the past, but this is probably the first of their anime I've seen that I would actively recommend, due to just how well the animation complements the story being told. High attention to detail, excellent understanding of visual comedy, a good use of cinematography throughout, and energetic animation that really elevates the product beyond a simple rom-com. I enjoyed this far more than I thought I would, so it's getting a recommendation. Wow, Yuri fans were eating good this season. And don't ask me how the implied and much fluffier Stardust Telepath outgayed the explicitly lesbian Ray Taylor, but it managed. 
This one falls squarely into the cute girls doing a thing genre of anime, and while the cast isn't overly unique, the chemistry between them creates something greater than its parts. It's rare for the bombastic airhead to not dominate a friend circle in a show like this, so I was pleasantly surprised to find the main shy character actually held her own in the spotlight. What this left us with was a fairly chill, relaxing sort of show, with a fun cast working to build rockets is a thing that ties them together. There's still conflict between them, and things aren't always smooth sailing, but the minor bouts of character drama feel relatable. On the surface, it doesn't really stand out, but watching the series proper gives you a better understanding of the character dynamics, while getting you into Umika's head as she deals with extreme social anxiety and that desire for friendship. Hell, there's some pretty serious issues in this one that give it some decent weight, at least more than you would expect from this sort of show. Tying that package together is an incredibly cute aesthetic that amps up the fluffiness to 11, making a fairly wholesome experience that's an enjoyable and relaxing watch. I've seen countless anime in this genre, and this one still stood out to me. And with that, we've made it to the middle of the pack. These are the shows that had one thing or another holding them back from greatness. Essentially, while enjoyable, they come with a conditional recommendation. So, let's check them out. I found Shy to be a hard series to get into. There's an obvious comparison to My Hero Academia here, but it's an entirely different sort of superhero anime, and I found myself struggling with whether I enjoyed what it was offering, and the heart of that issue is it has a rough start. The main character has no backbone, she's hit with an existential crisis first thing, and those get sidelined for a villain plot that takes forever to get off the ground. There's a lot of elements that are good in isolation, but the actual plot of this series is essentially non-existent until halfway through, with more than a few asides that should have been cut to actually advance the plot. Sorry, we don't really need an entire episode dedicated to this one side character who does. Fuck all, to be honest. However, getting away from the story, there's a solid focus on what it means to be a hero, and confronting your own insecurities that resonates, making this more a series about people than events. The characters themselves have a strong appeal, and are much deeper than most other superhero media, and that's great. But this isn't a slice of life series. It has a story it wants to tell, and decides to not get around to it until like, Episode 6, and even then you're kinda lucky, cause it takes until like episode 8 for it to really do anything with it. If you can look past the slow burn story, there's a strong thematic one there, but it takes patience. That, unfortunately, holds it back from broader appeal. It may surprise some that I'm in love with the villainess ranked way down here, but the issues that held this one back were entirely with its story. Having come in from the light novels and knowing Yuri's track record with getting second seasons, the fact this one leaves off on such a middling note essentially killed any hopes I had for it. Hell, most of the anime is spent on the first volume, which is somewhat of a feat considering it didn't feel like it was poorly paced. However, that does mean they're missing a solid ending point, which, I mean, they could have gotten had they adapted all the way to the end of the second book. That's like an actual ending too, and it's also something that could have easily been done. The animation was somewhat lackluster as well, really leaving an otherwise intriguing series with a middling adaptation, one it really didn't deserve. If you're looking for my thoughts on the books, I've linked a video in the top right where I go a lot more in depth into my feelings on this series. But as a standalone anime, because most viewers aren't going to pick up the books or manga, it's not great. I think one of the most underwhelming disappointments this season was the Demon Sword Master of Excalibur Academy. I didn't really have high hopes for this series, but all it had to do was basically not be a trope battle mess, and it tripped over that incredibly low bar by taking the usual suspects of a bad fantasy series, of an ancient powerful figure, reincarnating them into a little kid, and then the world has seemingly moved on without them, so no one remembers but their ancient power is still the best. Yeah, that made for a predictable story. The writing here was pretty much plucked from a word cloud of popular trends, smashed together without care, and run through a passable studio for the most bland anime product to hit the market in years. Nothing really stood out, but there's also not really much to criticize because of that. The most unique aspect of this was the setting, being a futuristic fantasy one where humanity is on the brink, but that's rendered essentially moot due to the fact it doesn't impact the story beyond aesthetic and cool factor. Want to see some mecha gun turrets blasting through a goth techno dragon? Great, we're gonna focus on the main character summoning skeletons instead. Or, I don't know, maybe just gaze awkwardly at some boobs? There was a lot of that for no reason. Anything this one offers can be found in other places with more engaging executions. So unless you're really into the future fantasy aesthetic, it's not worth your time. S-Rank Musume actually managed a better spot than I expected. 
for a fantasy anime, it has a fairly competent execution, some fun elements, a charming cast, and a surprisingly wholesome vibe. I won't say the setting is unique because, well, it relies on a ton of tired tropes like adventuring guilds, ranking systems, and job classes, but those aspects are also pretty well incorporated into the plot, so it feels like a natural part of the setting. The dad and daughter being strong, but not walking natural disasters in terms of strength, and hell, him even underestimating his abilities switches things up somewhat. But also a focus on the good adventures do in this world beyond slaying monsters gives this some much needed heart. But while it has some unique ideas, the presentation and execution are somewhat lacking. Pacing is a big issue without the action to tie things together, creating a very disjointed narrative by bouncing between two groups, so it really could have used some more focus. Aside from that, the animation is stylized, but also not great. It has some elements there that are appealing, but likely a rushed production that hampered the final product. It left this series in a weird spot, where the more day-to-day -day stuff is fine, but drags, and the action it wants to have is rushed and feels intrusive. If you're looking for a fairly chill fantasy series, this could scratch your itch. Kingdoms of Ruin was an overall disappointment. The first episode was fairly gross with its objectification, but after that initial shock, it falls into brooding edginess that manifests in a boring way. Hyperviolence and blood get old fairly quickly, and it isn't enough reason to stick around. After seeing so many heads explode, I'm not really hyped to see it again. That's all this anime really had to offer for entirely too long. And that's a shame, because there were some interesting elements early on that could have carried this series forward had they cared more about their setting and characters. The whole dichotomy of witches and humans, science and mysticism, while playing with the expectations that neither is quote unquote good, could lead to some complex storytelling, where the protagonists have to look for a third option for a better world. Instead, it mostly just wants to be a teenage angst fest for 12 episodes, while not really developing enough story to keep me engaged. Nihilism isn't a great arc for a character, especially when they dive headlong into it without looking back. It's almost like it knows it's getting boring too, because it jumps to a new idea every few episodes in a vain attempt to keep you watching. The second episode has the main character attacking the capital, then he goes to the moon with the last remaining witches, then he's all geared up for a battle, but fuck that, now we're in a desert. While that all happens, I'm stuck feeling like this is in its prologue still because, well, it failed to introduce anything. So this was a middling entry that'll for sure appeal to younger anime fans in the way that Elfin Light appealed to my generation. Kanojo Mo Kanojo hit in a season where it really didn't stand a chance. Yeah, the writing quality's the same, the animation is on a similar level, and the voice actors are still bringing their all, but unfortunately in terms of competition, 100 Girlfriends is essentially this, but better. It got outdone. On top of that, the progress this season just hits a standstill. Don't get me wrong, the addition of Shino to the main cast, rather than supporting, added a ton more variety to bounce off of, but despite the constant mounting tension in the ever-growing relationship, it takes forever for there to be a breaking point. So much so, it was starting to feel stale. So while this is more of a series I enjoyed, it just failed to really build beyond what season 1 started. And that's a shame. Okay, it's getting kind of hard to talk about this anymore, but uh, Dr. Stone was still a solid series. But again, uh, it just had some stiff competition. Seeing the end of this arc was great, especially after the sorry state our cast was left in at the end of Last Core. In fact, most of the 12 episodes we got this go around were pretty much the climax, while answering some major questions about this series. So yeah, a really solid conclusion to a pretty interesting season of a show that looks like it's gonna run with the whole thing. If you're into Dr. Stone, you're eating good, and likely going to be for the foreseeable future. The shows that were bad this season probably wouldn't have ranked this low if the rest hadn't been so much better. But that also means I'm allowed to be a bit more picky when the competition is stiff. And these are the shows that have more than one thing holding them back, so they're not worth a recommendation. Let's take a look. Megumi no Daigo, I couldn't really make it past the first episode. I'm not gonna lie, it's a fairly shallow opinion and I'm not super sorry about it. These aren't comprehensive reviews, these are my opinions on these shows. Whether I made it through the whole season or not, the fact I really can't be bothered to finish should speak volumes. And what turned me off here was the abysmal animation quality, really no apparent plot pulling me into the next episode, and a general lack of interest on my part. The description promised a whole lot more than the show actually delivered on, and honestly it felt more educational and drama oriented than like, it was actually telling a story. Apparently it's doing fairly well in Japan, so it has an audience. If you're really into firefighters, you may even enjoy it. 
A certain dude's VRMMO life was just fucking awful. I don't really get why anime, manga, and light novels like this are so prevalent, because there really isn't a story here. What I can tell you is how tired I am of VR game anime that have someone playing a game just like, flat out wrong. Like, I get the appeal from a storytelling perspective of people being super into crafting and such, but that's not how games work. And when it's going to be a central component of your story, you might want to actually make some realistic decisions. Otherwise, you end up with what's essentially isekai with extra steps. I found the almost episodic misadventures of a random archer pretty tedious. Because what little overarching story this had was minimal and uninteresting, it's not worth watching as much of it as I did. You want a better VR MMO anime? Watch Shangri-La Frontier, because it does every aspect of this series far better, while still managing to have a story. Probably the biggest disappointment this season was Goblin Slayer's return. It barely felt like the same series. This lacked the teeth that made the original season so gritty and engaging. Hell, when Leiden films tried to be gritty, it was still a completely sanitized version of what this series is about. Awful shit happening to ordinary people. Instead, it went with a bright, colorful aesthetic, rounded out the art, and ruined what was otherwise a moody and atmospheric horror series. Great, High Elf Archer looks cute now, but all the threat and danger was neutered in the process. It still continues what minimal story exists in Goblin Slayer, so if you're really into this series, I'm sure you'll get some enjoyment out of it. But if you were watching this for the dark fantasy and horror themes the original had, this'll feel like a far cry from it. To the point, it almost feels like an insult to fans. Kimi Zeta was abysmally bland. Yet another run-of-the-mill rom-com that could have been slotted into any season. Hell, I'm still surprised Project Number 9 didn't snag the adaptation here, but on top of being bland, it was packed full of cringe and wish fulfillment while pulling off to pick up any stray cliché it saw on the side of the street during its 12-episode road trip. Yeah, the loser nerd otaku type getting with the beautiful popular girl has been done to death, but have some damn faith in your characters and story at least. No, we don't need a forced love triangle for our bland-ass main character to debate whether he should stick with his girlfriend or his former crush. That was about the point I dropped this anime, because aside from that, they're also twin sisters. Because the plot here was generated by throwing darts at a word cloud printout. I don't think I need to be the one to tell you there's better rom-coms out this season. Or, in general. Not because it's obvious, but because this one will slip from your mind as soon as you turn away. It's that forgettable. So I think I'll just do that myself. So that's it. Fall 2023, and by extension, the year itself, is finally over. With extremely well done fantasy, really good comedy, and representation of just about every genre under the sun, having a series that stuck the landing. All that's left to see is if 2024 can keep the train rolling. But tell me your thoughts down below on what you enjoyed this season. I'd love to hear it. For now though, hey. You've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. Next season's coming up, so you know what that means. Throw me some money and you can vote on what I watch next. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Jmont33A, RobinDBL, and Samuel Chen for their continued support. Thanks for watching.